another question that I guess I was, uh, you know, what struck me as, as we've been talking for the last 30 minutes is how much all four of you have actually focused on the economic value. And, you know, AAPG, we, we, we talk about being a scientific association, but we're actually a professional association, so we're trying to do both. You know, we publish the bulletin, we do technical talks, but we're actually a professional association focusing on the business. And I guess, it, but when you look at our technical programs, when you look at the, the product and service offerings that AAPG provides, it really skews almost 80 to 90 percent uh, to the technical and you know maybe 10 or 15 percent to the non-technical commercial um any if anyone wants to sort of comment on that and say i mean how do you build a business professional out of a a, a raw geoscientist and do you have any ideas on how apg might participate in that yeah i david i think you hit the nail on the head uh, first of all i agree with Shannon on the, the data analytics component going forward uh, earth scientists and, and uh, geoscience programs at universities somehow have to include that type of thinking in it, just to, to agree with you uh, completely. When you go to the commercial comment, you, you know, we talk about this regularly. Large companies, many of you in the room, if you sit back and you reflect on, this, on, the, on the career paths of individuals, and I'm not talking about where they got to you know, CEO or whatever, I'm talking as they just, they, they work their way in their, their profession. The engineering community tends to always have the opportunity way earlier in their career to focus on the commercial and business side. Now, I'm parking on those side of the MBAs and the pure commercial people like that. Your scientists, tend, at least in our company, tend to lag that. <coughs> Excuse me. So, where I get worried about is we have to all, raise, all realize we're in a business. Uh, Bill uh, summarized it really well. You know, we have a $9 billion a year dividend, plus or minus a few bucks. And so people buy our stock, a Chevron stock, for the dividend. And yes, it's been growing the past few years, the, the share price, but they buy the dividend. So in the end, that's what we're here for. We're here to make money, please an investor, and, and keep going forward. The earlier you can get our earth scientists to think commercially, understand that yes, the science is what generates our opportunity set, but the business side is what moves it forward in the end, the better. So whether it's universities, if, it can't be necessarily part of the degree program, they have enough core courses, yeah. but encourage the advisors, encourage an economics course, encourage uh, things like that to think that bigger picture. And perhaps AEPG can offer some of that as well because that's a much more powerful individual when they focus on the science being a business, in my view. All right, so oil is the icky stuff we turn into money. And I, I had a real hard time when I first went to Statoil as head of exploration to get that across. Because it, it, was, it was very much a university kind of setting. Um, I mean, really, really smart people, really dedicated people, but the thought process of how does what I do turn into money and returns for the company just did not exist. And so we went through years of trying to give people line of sight between what they did in their job and how it made a difference to the company. And I'll give you just a small sentence of example. So I remember one time this group, they drilled a dry hole. And I said, you know, look, dry holes happen, but let's understand the financial side of this. So you drill the dry hole, that costs $50 million. And our division made $50 million that quarter. So guess what? We're, we're net zero. It just wiped it right out. Now, I don't want you to feel bad about that. I, I, I don't, no, I didn't, but I want you to understand the impact of what, which, what your business does onto the bottom line of the company. Now, thinking the opposite, if you find something, that's great, but then, you know, three to seven years, if it's an offshore thing, so when is the return going to come around? So just forcing the thinking creates a lot of change in behavior. When people start to think about how their actions impact the bottom line of the company, they start to look at their data differently. And it made a real difference. And I think that, you know, another aspect of this is size. So the, the smaller the company, the quicker the impact. So if you're a three-man shop, 
if you drill a dry hole, you probably have a business. So you kind of watch things much quicker, right? right. Um, versus the luxury of the bigger ones. And I, and I agree, my, I had the same thing in my career. I went to a shop and everything was like a science project. And the guys were great. We went to a bid round and I, and I parachuted into the shop and they said, well, we got all the blocks right. I said, well, which ones did you capture? We didn't capture any because we didn't have a dumb time. I'm thinking, well, you guys are missing the whole process here. It's not a science project. This is a commercial venture. And we switched things around. We started looking for the reservoirs first, rather than mapping every layer and doing all the, the other projects first. So size is critical, uh, as well as kind of teaching that. But it also starts at the top. All of us have to make sure that the young folks understand that, that it is a business, that there is somebody that's paying you your paycheck, and it's not even the guy there, it's the shareholders. And they become much more um, activist around insuring because they have so many opportunities. And when you look at a business that really has a return, uh, rate of return on capital in double digits, with a couple of companies exception, uh, in more than 10 years, that, that's a challenge, right? So we need to really both step up our game internally, but also meet the expectations of the shareholder. Um, if I could just amplify what's been said, if a company is functioning well, um, most of the decisions get made at the front line, and not everything comes up to the board level or, or, or senior, senior leadership. And the ability of teams to make those trade-offs between do I gather more data or do I cut costs? Do I, um, do I, I, I focus on long-term value or short-term cash? Most of those decisions get made at the front line by people with relatively few years of experience. So, so it's our job as leaders to give them the tools and the understanding how to make those decisions well. Because that, at the end of the day, is, is what delivers the aggregate performance for our, for our business leadership doesn't make all those decisions. It's, it's our ability to empower our frontline teams and provide them with the tools and the understanding to do that. And I think that's a challenge that that, um, that we've, we've taken into my business so that everyone from the front line all the way up to the senior most leaders understands how we make money. Okay. So what, one of the biggest lessons I ever had in my life about this was I, I left Shell after 15 years and I went to work for a, a little while for Marvin Davis, who some of you may know and some of you might not, but he was an independent in Denver. And the, the first day on the job, I walked into his office and he just said, he goes, Mr. Maloney, you are no longer spending shareholder money. You are spending my money. <laughs> and so I am going to give you a dollar. And every time I give you a dollar, you are going to give me three back. And if you have a venture that you can't walk in this door and promise me you're going to give me three back, do not bother talking to me. And I tell you what, and he was true to his word, and, and, and in a brutal kind of way. But you learned, a, 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 and I was a young guy, and you learned a lesson very, very fast. You, you either make money and think through the whole process of what this is going to do, or you're gone. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm going to ask one more question and then uh, and then go to you with uh, questions that you might have. Um, but let's dial it back. So, uh, uh, Chandler, you made the comment that within the unconventional business within Shell, you've got people working both sides, I mean, in a truly interdisciplinary way. Um, uh, Charles actually put a quote up by uh, uh, Ramanan Krishnamurti from the University of Houston this morning saying, innovation happens at the edges of disciplines. That seems to be a trend that we're hearing more and more in the industry. When you dial it back to the recruiting level, you're at the universities looking for students. Are you looking for that multidisciplinarity there? Or are you looking for you know, the best geoscientist you can get and then train them? You know, give them exposure to engineering. So, the, any thoughts on on that? Because one of the things we're looking at from an association perspective is obviously we've got sort of the mid-career people, uh, uh, my age. We've got the young professionals that are just coming in, and we've got the students. And when you look at AAPG's membership demographic, we call ourselves the Sincliners. 
we're the Gen Xers right <laughs> in the bottom of this bimodal distribution of members. Yeah, there's nine of us. That's uh, what it feels like. Three or four of us are in the room here. Um, uh, we're, just, we're, we're struggling to understand, you know, do you, do you want the best geoscientist you can get without the broadening uh, at the school level? And you'll handle that internally? Or, uh, or do you think someone coming in with that broader skill set would be helpful? I'll jump in. I mean, it probably depends on the size of your company. You know, if your company is a small one and its pure focus is one particular basin and one particular player, one particular rock, they're going to either go hire that experienced person or the school that's got a name for that right. type of setting, right? I think Chevron's view would be more what's the best geoscientist we can find. Um, if you look at the, in, I mentioned in my opening comments that they'll move back and forth through it. Our, our Permian business, uh, we have an exploration team, but it's all part of the of the asset group. So they're, they're, we may put a person in there that's a pure track record of exploration, but when they're finished on assignment, they understand assets, they understand the, 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 the whole business. So I think the key is, a, an earth scientist that's just got all of the fundamentals. When we look at the Permian, for example, we're about two, two million acres net. We've got, you know, depending on who you talk to, 11 to 14 benches we're evaluating. If you just take Chevron's acreage by itself, it's bigger than the state of Maryland when you count the benches at that. Half the size of the state of South Carolina. It's huge. So when you put these people in there, that business grows, grows, grows. We have to have people focused on everything from that supply chain to the cost focus to execution. But guess what? We found nine different parameters, if that's the right word, that are fundamentally changing the game there. It's not all brute force. The headlines are how many frack train loads and how much pressure, but guess what? Six of the nine are related to rocks. Six of the nine. And so the brute force component as an industry, we're going to be shifted away from that probably because there's going to be a bigger focus on the rocks. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. So my point is, I guess, is whether it's deep water and understanding those settings and how they get there, uh, or it's the rock uh, in, the, in a tight and shale type setting, in the end, it's the fundamental geology principles. A company, we're big enough to then teach and move and manipulate. But uh, strong geoscientists, good field experience, broad uh, curriculum, master's, PhD type thing, throw in the <laughs> economics course or two, and uh, I think they're set for a, a, a great career here. Okay. <coughs> I can, I can, when we, um, and the data analytics. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget that. Well, when we started growing style here in, in North America, well, everything that Bobby said was kind of a precondition, right? If you don't have the capability and the strong background, then you basically you don't even get in the door for any of the things. But then there's the intangibles, and, it, and it's not about did you take this course or that course. It's more about is this individual flexible? Will he or she be able to work on different kinds of projects and be open to that? Are they open-minded and inquisitive, like to, to the talk earlier, right? I mean, it, is is that inside this individual? And then the last one um, was on values. Uh, you know, is, is this a nice person? Is this someone that's going to be able to work and play well with others? Is, this, is, is he or she going to fit into the corporate culture well? Yeah. And we looked at all of those in addition to, you know, do you have the capability at the door? Yeah, I guess maybe there's another, I'll take a different tack here. So how many of you have been involved in that discovery of greater than 50 million barrels. <laughs> Not bad, this is usually when I ask that question, I get maybe two. But if you, if you look at a bigger selection, it is a really small group. And you need to start to think about then some of what Henry was talking about, which is the, the innovation and the things that led you down that road. In my time and earlier, we, we were called Mavericks because we didn't like to do the process. We, we had some different ways of doing things. We weren't disrespectful, but we had a different concept. And when you think then about going forward, and you really have to challenge the status quo, my view is that if, if you don't go through the day 
pushing back on somebody in particular says, well, we did that because we always did it that way. If you don't ask them why, at least once a day, then you're, you've kind of failed that day. And so I think as we start to go forward and think about this, this broader issue of exploration, <coughs> restarting it or reinvigorating it, we need to make sure we have some of those kinds of people. So when you talk to the students, it's trying to identify some of those. Some of them you may not know right away. It's even harder when you hire somebody in that's got experience to try to figure that out. But looking for folks that are those creative, innovative ones, as well as, shall we say, the ones that are going to do the detailed analysis and, and definitely have a significant role in the discovery, um, is two different roadmaps. And so that, to me, I think is a good question to ask about in the schools. Uh, how many of us, when we go, talk to the professors, you know, what, mm -hmm. who are the kids that seem a little bit different in their thinking, right? Really good at basics, got no, no question, but challenging stuff all the time. That would be my contribution there. Um, whenever I ask a question like this, my boss, he always says, challenge it's not or, it's and. And I think here the and kind of matters. Fundamentals of, of, of solid foundation in geoscience are critical, but the intangibles of, of curiosity, collaborative, being collaborative, um, the willingness to um, to expand one's one's own horizons, and the willingness to to kind of reach out and, and take initiative and be proactive on on. Um, on Pushing something or or or, um, or advocating something that you that you believe in are, are kind of the intangibles that, that are, are, are really important. Um, so, so I would I would encourage um, those who who are working with students. Fundamentals are are, are a precondition, but the, you know the the personality traits and the behaviors are are also a critical ingredient to long term success. If I could add to that, because I think it connects the dots here. You, you, you guys hit the nail on the head as well. One of the, the of our explorers that truly find that 50 million plus, the one that, when Chevron and Texaco came together, one of the first meetings, uh, the vice chairman's first question, forget all the talk about synergies and investors and all the one plus one equals three and all this typical merger stuff. And he looked at me across the table and he said, okay, in the new company, who are our oil finders and where are they? And I was really impressed by people who's a downstream. Right? Yeah, back to your point on downstream. So we've seen over the years that when we reflect on that question, it's all the attributes you just described, yeah, but it also, we see these people that are integrators, if that makes sense. They, they have the ability to kind of see everybody else's specialty. It's the basin modeler, mm -hmm. the, the stratigraphy, the petrophysicist, and somehow they're pulling something out of this, and they pull together this story that others couldn't. And that integrator, uh, we had one of our best retired, uh, you know, last year, and the first comment we had, where's Tim Morgan? Mm. And so not only were they outstanding earth scientists, they were collaborative, they had all the basics, they had an ability to see a spark in each of the different specialties and tie it together, and boom, it's a discovery, or a new lease, or a new play. Yeah, they're very unique and they're fun to be around and they make a difference. And, and I think there's two quick aspects of that. One is the first identifying, but the second is how do you provide the environment for them to thrive because right. they often are a little bit different, right? I mean, like I said, I'm not a big process guy, um, but but I many of you others think about that, right? I mean, it's a the creative folks, the Steve Jobs kind of guy, but Look what happens to them. Right. Okay, questions from the audience. <laughs> 